and I will be talking about the HP Primera. My name is Alex Oprinsky. I'm one of the system architects of Primera. And one thing I want to emphasize, I'm not going to be showing the, those uh, boring tables about number of cores, number of ports, and uh, how much stuff you can plug into it, because I'm sure you've seen this before, and if you haven't, we can provide that. That's not what this session is all about. This session is about the Primera Insights, what we build it for, why it's going to deliver, what we th say it's going to deliver, and what the future looks like for the Primera platform. Uh, so that slide looks familiar. So the funny thing is that the, the storage has changed dramatically in like, like last 50 years. Anytime one of you shows up in the San Jose in the Bay Area, make sure to visit Computer History Museum. It's in Mountain View, and it's a fascinating place. It's a mind-blowing place to visit. You can actually see there's a first storage drive that was introduced by IBM. It's called RAMAC-1. It was introduced in 1953, and the thing was actually hydraulically powered. In order to do a seek, you had to like, in introduce hydraulic power. You have a storage array that leaks hydraulic fluid. You just can't make this up. And in the last flash memory summit, they're coming up with things like carbon nanotubes. You can actually have a 1947 relay-based storage at a nanotube scale. This is mind-blowing at the same level. So the funny thing is the technology has changed quite a bit. In fact, it, it's changed so much that people stop keeping track by what is the scale of capacity change in the world. However, the customer challenges haven't changed. This is bizarre because I've been doing this. I haven't been in this field for 50 years, obviously, but I've been doing this for a while. And it's always about the same stuff. Well, my infrastructure is too complex. I can't keep up. I, we just keep on changing things because those pesky users of ours constantly want different stuff. And besides, we have too many of them, and they all want different things. So we don't really know what to do about this. Basically, I just want to say this. I'm buying that stuff. That stuff is expensive. It's a reasonably large portion of my IT budget. Make sure you make the most of it. Make sure I pay the least. And if there are any problems, I don't want to know. So th this is basically the summary of any CIO today. And it's very difficult to deliver on this. In fact, I remember, I think it was like early 2000s, there was a customer that has shown me their primary management tool for all their storage. It was a gigantic whiteboard with all the ports and all the connections and all the hosts connected, outlined, and the gigantic <laughs> sticker, not to be erased at the pain of death, because this is my primary management tool. Now, we don't want that. At the same time, it's very difficult to manage that stuff, because again, those things are growing. The capacities are growing. The speeds and feeds are growing. The number of objects they need to manage is growing. So we built Primera to try and tackle that. Okay. So speeds and feeds are important. You need to be able to deliver to the customer requirements, but you also need to be able to make sure that you get the most out of your hardware, and you don't cause customer too much headache when you manage that. So uh, there will be three points that I would like to cover specifically about Primera. The new architecture, and again, this is where speeds and feeds will come in. I will expect to get some questions about some of the protocols that are or aren't there. We'll, we'll talk about that, and I'll, I'll explain the rationale behind our roadmap with Primera. Uh, so Primera is built for intelligence. One of the main concepts of Primera's new architecture is to provide the own array intelligence. I will give some examples of what we already have and what we're working on. This is fascinating stuff. Basically, this thing gets you as close as possible to the ideal world of the storage admin, and this is clairvoyance. Clairvoyance is the best, right? I mean, if you know things before they happen, you can move stuff around. You can make sure that problems go away. Now, I found clairvoyance to be very difficult to achieve. We're working on that, but it weighs out. So this is the next best thing, and I think you will be impressed just as I'm impressed by the tech that's going on right here. And the management and resiliency. So in fact, the way Primera is built, we're looking at the resiliency as part of management paradigm. One does not exist without the other. 
Primera is about deli delivering a 100% availability solution to the customer. To do that, you need to understand how it is managed, and you also need to understand what the resiliency story is behind it. So let's dive right in. Architected for speed and intelligence. Again, remember, speeds and feeds are important. Yes, you need to be able to deliver stuff. But you also need to be, be able to deliver it intelligently. Now, we all know, putting as much hardware as possible behind the problem will only get you so far. You'll pay an arm and a leg. You'll need to deal with upgrades. You'll need to refresh your technology when the next best Intel CPU is coming out. By the way, I, again, looking at the Intel CPUs right now, I have no idea how many they actually have, even model-wise. I'm not even talking specific, specific SKUs. Because it's a very, very big lineup. Figuring out what they can do, what they can deliver, and how they can deliver what they can deliver is a big deal. So picking the right hardware is important, but figuring out what to do with it so it will be flexible enough to deliver what you want is the main deal. So there are three major tenets to primary architecture, so it's all active. So we have no standby hardware in primary design. So this is not very new. Tripart did not have uh, most of the hardware in Tripart was also active. The primary takes, takes it to the next level by using it better. Uh, memory driven, so it is optimized for SCM and for NVMe. In fact, we've delivered SCM in Tripart before we deployed with NVMe, with the a Primera. It's not deployed with Primera now. There's a reason why it's not deployed with Primera now. I will talk about that. It will be deployed with Primera. We learned some valuable lessons with SCM. And intelligent. The intelligence part is paramount for us. You need a storage array that will take care of problems before the customer knows it. Remember that third part? If it breaks, just take care of it. I don't want to know. And this is weird again because I looked and I've spoken with many customers that different jobs. Uh, customers usually go into two basic categories. There is a 10% or 15% of customers who want to know everything. They want to know where everything plugs. They want to know how everything connects. They usually know more about the systems that they deploy than the vendors themselves. But the vast majority of the customers either don't know or don't care. And this is really weird because like, your business depends on that stuff, but then they say, well, you know, it's too complex. I can't really understand the depth of technology, so I trust the vendor. I just want to make sure that you do right by me. Intelligence in Primera helps us to do just that. So let's talk about speeds first. So the biggest problem of any mission-critical storage array, and the question was asked, so what constitutes a mission-critical storage array? Because everybody is fast nowadays. I mean, you can, technologies allow you to be fast, especially if you throw hardware at it. So this is what you have today. And again, this is not really a new problem. For mission critical arrays, latency is much more important than IOPS. Yes, your array can do 50 gazillion IOPS. But if every transaction takes five milliseconds, that's no good for a database transactional system. Primary storage is transactional storage. Latency is important. Now, when you increase IOPS, you experience latency creep. That's just a fact of life. This is what you have today. You've been dealing with storage systems for a while. You have it, and you know why. The main reason why you get this guy here is uh, SCSI. So SCSI protocol has been introduced in 1982. This is unbelievable. It hasn't materially changed since then. Now, if you go to the T10 website, and I go regularly, sometimes more than I should, uh, you will see, yes, there was SCSI 1, there was SCSI 2, SCSI 3, SCSI 4. It's very, very detailed. There are lots of models. There are lots of commands that materially it hasn't changed. It's a single stream, short queue uh, protocol, which simply cannot keep up. Original SCSI was 5 megabytes per second, 8 bytes. Like that was 512 byte blocks, five megabytes per second. That's what you could get. 10 megabytes per second, 20, 40. Today, you are talking about devices that can deliver 
Actually, nobody knows how much they, modern SSDs can deliver because the numbers that the manufacturers publish have nothing to do with reality. It has to do with workloads, but they can deliver more than five megabytes per second. We can agree on that. So SCSI has matured, but it is becoming a bottleneck. So again, this is where NVMe comes into play. And we'll talk about NVMe more here. One of the primary reasons for NVMe in business critical applications is to address this, because NVMe can actually deliver this, okay? And this is what you want. Increase of IOPS do not necessarily bring increase of latency until you hit a saturation. Eventually, you will hit a saturation. You will run out of disk bandwidth, you run out of CPU in your array, you will run out of something. Everybody runs out of something. What you want is you want this line to be as flat as possible until you run out of that certain something. So the funny thing is, in order to achieve that, you need to look at the picture end to end. So this is the end to end storage system here. You have your servers, <coughs> you have your fabric, you have your back end, and you have your storage array in the middle. So this is what enterprise business critical system lo looks like today. The funny thing is that if you don't have an NVMe build system end to end, uh, yeah, you can put NVMe here, you can put NVMe here. If that guy here does not deliver what it's supposed to deliver, you're not going to take, get much advantage of NVMe. So now, what is NVMe good for? So it's, it's a very abused technology, I think. It's very, very hyped. There are lots of acronyms there. If you go and read the NVMe specs, uh, they are very detailed in some areas. They are somewhat vague in some other areas. So basically, NVMe comes to replace SCSI. NVMe is about different transport. It's about different protocol. And it's also somewhat about different semantics. But semantics are less important. So transport and protocol is the most important. The most important part about NVMe is it's huge concurrency. SCSI has a single queue. Usually, what's your normal queue depth on the Linux system? Like 32. If your advantages, like if you if you adventurous, it will be 64. There are some customers that I've seen go to 128, one queue, 128 commands, going to eventually going to SSD that can do 400,000 IOs per second. Well, that's not really impressive. NVMe addresses that. Like you can have thousands of queues with thousands of entries. It's totally impractical. Most people have tens to maybe hundreds of queues with thousands of entries. Still, a notable improvement. That is the reason NVMe delivers on this. Basically, they're saying, whatever it is that your bottleneck is inside, make sure that it does not interfere with my concurrency. You will get that. So in our world, we, we design Primera, first of all, to address the concurrency in the arrays. Because once you address the concurrency in the arrays, everything else will follow. So no positive components, I already mentioned that. Primera is built uh, around the next generation, new generation ASIC that was specifically built for NVMe. So if you remember, it, the previous Primeras had an ASIC that was specifically designed for flash environment. And again, in the flash world, especially in the hybrid world, cache was still important, so the primary goal of, of three-part A6 was to manage memory. With Primera, uh, this is the current architecture of Primera node. You can see there is no more memory attached to the A6. A6 have no more cache. We got rid of ASIC attached device attached cache. Uh, many reasons for that. One good reason for that is, well, you know, the Intel is doing such an awesome job right now. Memories have really picked up. You can configure as much memory as you like for today's CPUs. That was not always the case, but now it is the case. You can configure as much as you like. So we took them at the word. Works fine. That is actually something that allows us to unify memory and section it dynamically as needed. We'll talk about it when we'll talk about hosting other things on Primer. We've Change the ASIC design completely because, again, remember, the primary goal of Primera is to provide the NVMe readiness with concurrency. This is what it looks like. Essentially, to make a long story short, every CPU core 
on every node has a direct path through an ASIC to every CPU core on every other node. So essentially what we're having in Primera is a completely lockless architecture where CPU cores do not need to arbitrate for path to different nodes. Remember, Primera is active. It's all active. All nodes participate equally. All nodes exchange information all the time. And I.O. can land on this node and be serviced on that node. In order to make sure that it happens non-disruptively, you needed to have the proper bandwidth. Proper bandwidth is not enough. You also needed to have enough of those lanes and, and queues to make sure that you can actually deliver. This is the core of the primary architecture. The core of primary architecture is we have enough internode connectivity to provide for NVMe concurrency. So where are the front end and the back end in this diagram? That's a great question. So they don't exist. Exactly from your point of view, front end and back ends are hosted by the CPUs. So this is, again, well, I had to make this claim. I didn't. I'm an engineer. So there are certain things, like, as you can tell, there are certain things that are kind of missed by engineers. They just do things. So keep on asking those kinds of questions. There are some uh, things that yeah, are not clear. So each one of those CPU, CPU in Intel's world uh, is this, this huge thing with the heat sink, but it houses multiple CPU cores. So modern CPUs can have 20, 40 cores, depending on the model of the CPU you use. Each one of those purple rectangles is actually a CPU. So it can have 20 cores each. So each, uh, on a large Primera, each node will have two CPUs. Each CPU can have 20 cores. And those CPUs also have PCIe lanes that feed the HBAs for front end and the HBAs for the back end. So they all exist here. The idea, though, is that each CPU has a path to every, each core in each CPU has a path to each core on every other CPU locally. That is a hardware requirement to actually take advantage of NVMe anytime. If you don't have this, there's no point in having NVMe on the front or at the back. So uh, if you look at this, so this is what the latency response looks on conventional arrays nowadays. So you have this double hump thing. And there is, a, a, and by the way, this happens on the also on SSD machines. It's much more pronounced on the hybrid machines, but on flash machines, you also get this. The reason you get this is simple. This is where your iOS gets serviced out of cache. If it's in memory, this is what you get. And this is about like 150, 170 microseconds. That's a reasonable time uh, for cache accounting for all the protocols in between. Uh, this is when the I.O. goes to the back end with SSD, okay? Because again, let's be reasonable, like 350 to 400 microseconds, if you need to go all the way to SSD through whatever your back end protocol is, that's reasonable time. Um, with spinning disks, that thing will probably be somewhere over here. But that still will be the same picture. So is this good? Well. Maybe. But what we really want is this, right? What you want is predictability. And remember, Primera is all about business critical. Business critical guys want predictability. They say, well, I really want to know what my array will deliver. I want to be predictable. I'd rather be slower and predictable than faster. Anybody here dealt with mainframes? That actually is the motto of mainframe guys. So this is weird because I worked with mainframe before I spoke with mainframe people. So mainframe developers, including storage developers, they just laugh at us. They basically say, well, you guys are all playing toys because the, the best system has ever been developed. That's MVS. The last, last revision was 1972. Nothing has changed since then because nothing needs to be changed. Now, this is debatable because they have been changing things under the hood. But in mainframe systems, which were business critical systems, were a gold standard for business, business critical systems for a while, predictability was always valued higher than peak performance at some point. I mean, that's what they were looking at. 
So this is what Primera is delivering. We want to get most of our I.O. serviced in under 300 microseconds. Primera delivers on that. Okay? So the interesting thing is once I'm we sorry have, to interrupt. Um, is that microseconds or milliseconds? Microseconds. Okay, thank you. Because there's a 300 MS, a 0.3 MS, and it was confusing to me. 0 0.3 milliseconds. Yeah. That's right. 300 microseconds. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yeah. No, those are, yeah, those are 300 microseconds. So this is confusing again. Visualization is not my thing. <laughs> so this is what we deliver today. This is what we deliver today with current Primera architecture without NVMe. Okay? This is, you can actually, you, that's what we get. And this is not in the lab. We get it on the real life customer workloads. So if we deliver this today without NVMe, the thing that NVMe will give you is instead of converging those two peaks, because that's what NVMe's primary job was. NVMe's primary introduction for other systems was to get this thing here. Now, we can deliver this without NVMe, so the best you can get with NVMe in its current form is actually get this thing and move it a little. Sure, we can move it. Introduction of NVMe will deliver that. Not disparaging that, you want it moved to the left. In fact, the customers want it moved into negative territory. Basically, they want you to service their IOs before they ask for it. Clairvoyance. By the way, anybody here online, make sure to Google S4, super simple storage system. You'll get a laugh out of it. It's a hoax, and then some people are nodding because they know about it. The point is that someone made a joke online years ago saying, well, the best system is a system you never need to read. Just write the data, and since you never need to read it, it will give you the best performance ever. It's a hoax. The website exists. Write-only memory. Well, write-only memory, and that's called super, super simple storage system. You Google it. It's hilarious. The point is they have a price matrix, and some people actually try to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> the reason people try to buy it was that that sounds really cool because it's really, really simple. I don't need to worry about a bunch of stuff. That shows you how much customers know you need to help them out here. The point is, with NVMe, yeah, we want to move this to the left. Absolutely. We will be able to move this to the left. But without Primera architecture, we wouldn't have been possible because you just moved both humps to the left. And that's not what we want. So again, summing up. So Primera is about all active. It's about memory driven. And it's about completely lockless. So we can deliver those numbers in a for you package. And those numbers are actually real life numbers. This is, a no, this is not lab. This is not benchmark. This is not a carefully orchestrated workload which is just designed to deliver hero numbers. This is real life transactional workload based. Uh, and I think in the for you package, this is damn impressive numbers. Yeah, so how, how, how big is this machine? So you said for you. So, it's a, so the Primera is that particular thing was measured on the for you machine with no external drive racks. So I don't recall the exact capacity, but it was configured with reasonably large number of drives, like 96 SSDs or 128 SSDs, but not, nothing like earth shattering. So it's not a demo queen? No. This is like, again, this is, we don't, we decided not to publish hero numbers anymore because that kind of diverges from the goal of Primera being the mission critical thing because you can publish hero numbers, then it violates tenant number three because when it gets deployed at the customer site and they run something else, Suddenly they get one third, one fifth, or one tenth of what you promised, and now you need to go and explain, ah, yeah, you're also running that stuff that we did not really plan in demo. We don't want to do that. And I agree. I think that um, IOPS today are really not the metric we should be relying on. I think when we talk about latencies, uh, particularly latencies and scalability uh, from array to array, fabric um, and, the, and the protocols leveraged there. That's where the real differentiation comes. 100% agree. Latency, especially for business critical apps, latency, stable, predictable latency up to your saturation point is what you need to worry about. If you want more IOPS, you can put another array into your workload. Besides, it comes back into resiliency. We found 
that people don't really want to have multi-petabyte boxes with thousands of uh, customers running on the same array. I worked uh, for a different company. Uh, I think back in a while we had a customer that had like 20 arrays and 4,500 servers attached to them. So that was not really a very well balanced or very well designed architecture because they kept on running like crazy trying to figure out where the hotspots are between those arrays. So uh, you don't want to put all eggs in one basket. You want to deliver predictable latency when you want someone to tell you you're running out of IOPS. Those are the two things we found out to be most helpful. Deliver good latency and give ample warning when you're running out of IOPS. Things can be done. So where are we with NVMe? Can I ask a quick yeah. question about sure. the chart before you move on? So um, the elimination of the double hump, is yeah. that just the protocol change or does this also have to do with the medium? Are you talking? Yeah, so the, that depends, it depends on the system. In some cases, in, with some people, the elimination of the double hump would be a combination of architectural things. In Primera, yeah, I specifically mean in your yeah. case. So in our case, there. it has nothing to do with the media. Primera, that was taken with the so SaaS media. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah both that's... ways, this is only NVMe. Yes. So okay. I actually have backup charts uh, when we run out of through the content, hopefully. Well, we can take a look. We can take a look at the breakdown of where the media plays in NVMe world. And maybe, you know what, just jumping the gun here. If you look at the media today, what is the difference between NVMe NAND, NAND drive and SAS NAND drive in terms of latency? Well, the short answer is there is none. Because it's the same NAND media. Well, the controller is a little more, the controller is a little more sophisticated. They have more channels into the NAND, but you can get the same thing with the SAS. They just don't build them like this. The difference is in the protocol SAS is really old. SAS is SCSI. The difference is in protocol basically you can get to your media faster with an NVMe drive. But the NVMe drive, so like, let's look, look at NAND today. NAND can deliver between 70 and 90 microseconds on the media. So you will get this with SAS, you will get this with NVMe. The question is, what is your controller and media and transport overhead? With SAS, it will be higher, right? So that thing will move to the left when we introduce NVMe. By how much? That's a different story. And arguably, it won't move by much, but it doesn't really matter, because even if it moves by 10%, that's 10% lower latency. That's 10% more things that the customer can do in the transactional array. That's money for the customer. So we want to introduce this. But we had to do this after the internal array locklessness has been established. Otherwise, you will just keep those two. So, NVMe. Uh, so we have, we have introduced a CM uh, NVMe card in actually in three part. In 20Ks and 9Ks, you can actually stick an SCM card, which is an NVMe PCIe driven card. SCM cards do not exist. Intel obtained 3D cross point cards do not exist in any other protocol. So we already have NVMe support even in three part, even before Primera. We introduced it as a cache for slower media. Uh, we have some exposure, we learn from it. We're going to reintroduce it into Primera after we've digested the field reactions. And we can talk about it after this, uh, or we can talk about it if we have time. So caching is a tricky business. Uh, just throwing more cash at your system doesn't necessarily going to help you in any way, shape, or form. It will just make you pay more. Uh, caching everything is not necessarily a good idea. Again, it has been researched a while ago. I believe things change a little in our business. But in, I think it was researched in like early 2000s, doubling your data cache increases your hit ratio by five to 7%. That's just a fact of life. Now, thing is that with storage class memory, you can more than double your cache. You can increase your cache tenfold because those media, those media are very, very large. So if you increase your cache tenfold, will it increase your hit ratio by 50%? Well, you know what? Not really. Not with the current world's architectures, not with the current work workloads. We see more and more random workloads out there because the hosts tend to randomize. 
multi-passing tends to randomize. People tend to randomize. So caching needs to be more and more intelligent. We'll talk about that. That's a direct segue into intelligence. But we do have NVMe right here. So next thing is NVMe backend. So we will have NVMe backend. The point for NVMe backend for us, as you can see, you're not going to get much out of NVMe backend with Primera because Primera already delivers pretty awesome latencies. The, what I've shown you, the previous chart, that's a true chart. Right now, the numbers are we can deliver approximately 75% of all our IOs under 250 microseconds. Again, this is a measured number. This is not some benchmark. We measure like our normal read workloads will give you 250 microseconds and 75% of the time, which is good. If you account for the entire stack, moving to the back end on NVMe, uh, yeah, we'll make it better, but not by much. The point, though, is that at some point, NVMe media will simply become cheaper than SAS. That's just a fact of life. Yeah, they're getting faster, of course, because SAS is not going anywhere. 12 gigabit per second, that's what you can get today. Uh, you can need to play tricks to make it go faster. It, nobody is going to invest in this. Now NVMe media is all the rage. At some point, NVMe drives will actually become cheaper. By the time they become cheaper and it actually makes economic sense for the customer to have them, we'll have it. The hardware is there. Primera is ready. So NVMe drives are going to be cheaper, but does that mean that NVMe over F uh, attachments are going to be cheaper as I'll well? Get, I'll get to NVMe over okay. F attachments yeah. in a second. First of all, let's talk about the media, because the next gen Primera that comes after the current release, current release has NVMe slots in it. I mean, that 4U thing that I've shown you, some of the slots, drive slots that we have in the 4U enclosure are dual purpose. You can stick NVMe media in them right now. <coughs> we'll have a next gen machine that will have all slots to be NVMe. So the hardware is there. The drives come out. You will have internal drives to be NVMe. In order to support NVMe over fabric enclosure on the back end, you will need to pay for the enclosure. The enclosure will need to be intelligent because it has to run NVMe over fabric target. Yeah. And this is where getting here. NVMe over fabric target will have NVMe over fabric target at the same time. We will have internal NVMe drives. We'll actually release them both together. Because it actually makes no sense to release them separately. If you have an NVMe box without a backend fabric attached, you can't really expand the capacity beyond the internal drives. It makes really no sense. So they're going to come out together. And that box will be slightly more complicated than the current like ROG SAS enclosures, because the current SAS enclosure is just a SAS extender. It really has no intelligence of its own. Yes? So <clears throat> primarily, is this advantage? architected for um, what type of workloads, virtual or physical? Because there's obviously overhead for virtual, even though it's sometimes very nominal. So have you seen you know, this, which environment take advantage of this? When more? you say virtual workloads, you mean VMware? Yeah, like virtualization or versus like you know, bare metal. I mean, you know, some, some. So this is a great question. Uh, and I will need to think about it because we don't actually see much difference from our point of view. A virtual workload, a VMware environment, is exactly as a physical workload at the storage array level because they all enter through the same front end port. Uh, we have some insights into that, but I don't have an answer for that. Let me look into it. Because then, the, then the extension would be, you know. Absolutely. Um, Cloud or containers, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let me let me get that's a wonderful question. So again, the back end is all about cost. There was and, speculation yeah. about how long it might be until we might start seeing the price come down to where it's more competitive. Uh, so you guys are going to hold me to it. No, not at all. So yeah, so the speculation, think. speculation is the probably end of 2020, beginning of 2021. That's faster than I thought. Yeah, that's that's like a, like that that market-based speculation. By the way, again, anybody attended the Flash Memory Summit, uh, the current Flash Memory Summit? There is actually speculation that in 2030 there will be no DRAM. Like, store, like fa fa uh, fast performing storage class memory like uh, MRAM will replace DRAM and that will really break our world because DRAM has implications for refresh. Like just imagine that you can build a CPU complex that doesn't need to refresh DRAM. That means essentially that your servers will be able to draw 
one quarter of the current power. But that's speculation. So, front end attach. And there's a very, very bright point here is customer adoption. So, customer adoption is important. So, NVMe over fabric front end attach, Primera is ready today. You can run NVMe over fabric fiber channel on our current hardware. It requires software support. The current LPE 32Ks that we use in Primera uh, front end HBAs can be used for an NVMe over fabric target over fiber channel. The one question is well, actually, I have two questions. A, who are you going to connect it to? And B, why? So, who are you going to connect it to right now is Linux. You have a, you have a Linux initiator and VMware a fabric initiator for fiber channel, I think in 4.18. Um, it's not really widely adopted, but you can, you can connect. Uh, why? That's a great question, because the only reason to use fiber channel for NVMe over fabric is to retain your infrastructure. Okay, if you invested gazillions in your fabric, you want to retain it. Uh, at some point, there will be customer adoption. When there is a customer adoption, we'll have it. Hardware is there. There's not going to be any hardware changes. We'll support both fiber channel and raw key over either 100 or 200 gig. And again, that's not on us. That is on the initiator, depending when the initiator becomes available, the technology. So both 100 and 200 are available today. 100 is like CX-5 is reasonably cheap. The CX-6 is not so because it's not very widely adapted. But the main point is the fabric. Who has widely deployed 100 gig fabrics for their hosts? That's not there yet. At some point, it will be there. When it is there, well, again, I'm not talking about the hyperscalers. The hyperscalers, what, what AWS does inside their big shops, it's up to them because they can actually throw hardware at things and get, make things happen. From the business perspective, enterprise business class arrays won't have this until like probably end 2021. And yeah, we're running over time, but then Beth finished earlier, so I have more time. And I have some more awesome things to share with you guys. So the last thing about primary architecture, and that is kind of my mind-blowing thing which you need to retain. And this is the last slide, so there was someone told me that the last that the people remember the last thing that was said. So remember this. Uh, Primera software was redesigned the same way Primera hardware was redesigned, and the main goal of Primera software is to get away from this into this, and I know those are just a bunch of squares on the, on the slide, but what they mean is that original software was always deployed as a package. It had all the features combined. You wanted a new feature, you had to get a new package with all that's implied. And that was cumbersome to say the least. So we've changed things in how Primera is run, how Primera is deployed, how Primera is updated, but those are just enablers for us to move here where in the future, if you need a new feature, you will get the binary for that feature it will be deployed. You don't need to redeploy the entire software. It will be much more non-disruptive. I wanted to say much less disruptive, but uh, much more non-disruptive sounds cooler. And we'll be able to host applications that will talk with Primera data path. And most of those applications have to do with intelligence because we want to make Primera to be self-tuning, self-administrating, self-administrating as close to clairvoyance as possible. And this is a great segue into my next section, which is essentially intelligence changes everything. You can build the best machine with the best speeds and feeds, and it will only take you so far, because remember that third point, if it breaks, just have it somehow fixed without me knowing about it, that's the preferred mode of operation at least for 85% of the customers. So to do that, uh, there are multiple things that we can actually do in Primera to harvest the world's data about all the storage arrays that we have out there in order to make Primera self-tuning, in order to make it literally self-healing. So, there was a question about InfoSight. The first thing about InfoSight was that, you know, we know what's going on with like 80,000 machines or so that we have on an installed base. 
uh, some of those machines experience issues. We get escalated with those issues. Once we figure out what those issues are, we can use the InfoSight metrics to say, hey, if that issue happened on this machine under those circumstances, maybe we can develop some sort of signature that will say, you know, if those circumstances start appearing on other machines, maybe they will develop this issue. Maybe they won't, but likely they will. So those are called peak signatures. We actually develop tons and tons of those signatures. We store them in a signature database. And we take proactive action without, sometimes without customer even knowing. Because there are some things we can do without alerting the customer, some things we can do way in advance, making sure that the customer takes proactive action during a like a maintenance cycle without taking a disruption. So, okay, troubleshooting is great. Self-healing, but at least alerting about potential problems is great. But that's not enough because all that happens in a reasonably long cycle. You have a machine, you have 80,000 machines, you need to gather the signatures, you need to process the data. It's a reasonably large data lake. It's very valuable for us, but it is not a substitute for onboard intelligence, okay? And we've been investing very, very hard for onboard embedded intelligence on Primera. In fact, Primera hosts and will host a number of AI-based tools that will help us to glean some insights into what's going on in the machine. So that, that is like a standard slide. I mean, you, you guys understand how this works. So we collect the telemetry because most of our arrays call home regularly. And instead of just throwing those data into logs and archiving them, we do stuff with them. Uh, learn. There's a lot of AI going on in InfoSight. There's a lot of AI is happening, it's going to be happening on Primera as well. Correlate with other machines and then act. The act part is the challenging part. Well, I'll talk about this. So as I said, some of that stuff that we gather from the field and some of the stuff that we run on the arrays actually offers something that we call insights into what's going on in the data center. So. Uh, those three we already have deployed, so topology insights. 80% of the problems happen outside the storage array. As painful as it is, usually storage people get escalated, well, you know, my storage array is not working. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. 80% of the problems happen elsewhere, trying to help the admin to glean where the issues happen, understand why they happen, which VMs are responsible for those uh, troubles is very, very important. So topology insights, this is not really an AI. This is a statistical correlation engine. Some people, there are some purists in the AI ML communities that uh, balk when you refer to statistical correlation tool as an AI. So I we're purists about everything, so you can, you can rely on us to balk. So that's why I had, I had a disclaimer out there. Yes. We have a tool called Performance Insights. So Performance Insights is something that is built to address the next question. Okay, I've used Topology Insights. I've identified who is the culprit. Okay, now, is this the hardware problem or something else? And this is a surprisingly difficult question to answer. 80% of the time when you hit a performance issue, this is a hardware problem. You're running out of steam on your hardware but it's very, very difficult to actually say that because arrays nowadays are very, very complicated and customer environments are even more complicated. Let's say this is not hardware. What else is there? So we have something called workload insights that can tell you, has something changed? Is my performance problem contributed by my workload change. Maybe my array is currently misconfigured. Maybe something changed. Maybe I onboarded a new application that now changed my workload pattern and I no longer fit what the array was originally sized for. You'll be surprised how difficult it is to troubleshoot those kinds of problems because nobody knows what the array was sized for four years after it was bought. And again, you don't want to know. So those are specifically, we call them insights. So topology insights, again, it's a statistical correlation uh, machine where we observe performance problems over the timeline. And this, again, this is a true graphic. You can actually use that on SSMC. And 
you can actually zoom in on the performance issue and then follow through from a VM to VMDK to a data store to a specific host virtual volume in the system. So that gets us to the question about virtual to physical. So this thing here is designed to connect the virtual to physical, just provide you with a path. Because I don't know the answer to the performance question, but I do know the answer to troubleshooting question. This is an astonishingly difficult problem to troubleshoot, especially if you have thousands of VMs deployed and changing daily. Having a timeline, figuring out what is going on, how will help you to figure out, try, figure out what changed. You can actually identify, we have a very, very nice chart, which I did not include here, that shows which VM is to blame. <coughs> a tool that can actually break down the path from the VM all the way down up to the drive and can highlight, are you running out of physical port? Are you running off the VM or the data store? Is there an issue with the VMDK? It actually highlights it color wide. So you can zoom in. It gives you a zip lane view into what's going on. Is that an engineering tool or a customer tool? No, this is this can run on this SMC. Mm -hmm. And is this Primera or is this three part? So this is available with Primera. They will be we'll consider backporting it with three part, but it's available with Primera. So info site driven <coughs> analytics. Here. Yes. Does this come standard, or do you need to, to purchase? And you don't need to purchase anything. All licenses are included. Okay. I do like that. That was one of the things that Nimble did really, really well, is uh, to just include everything. You buy the thing, you get the thing. Um, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, you buy the thing, you get all the things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So the, the workload insight, though, is that going to go into things like um, whether or not a, uh, a malware has started to address a given workload and uh, an affected performance across the array or, or across the entire environment. So can you hold on to that until the next slide? After that, we'll talk about workload insights. Okay. I will address that. The short, short answer is eventually. Fair enough. So performance insights. So we've developed a model for the performance of Primera uh, which can predict whether you're running out of steam in terms of hardware. You want to know if you're hitting your port bottlenecks. I mean, it's very rare today to hit port bottlenecks, but it's possible, especially if your system is misconfigured. The problem is this. Usually, what you observe is a latency spike. This is what you observe. You have a latency spike. Now, the question is, is this latency spike caused by a hardware issue or by something else? So performance insights uh, will actually answer that question. We've developed a model for the Primera that can calculate at any given time what the saturation levels for that particular array look like, what it can run, what it can run for this specific workload combination. Because you guys all have been doing this for a while. You know that saturation levels for the array depend on the workload. You can't just quote an absolute number. Performance numbers have to do with the actual workload you're running. And specifically, this is the exact problem that you said that Primera was dissolved to solve. Yeah. So like this is supposed to be what this system is for. This is, yeah. the, this is the first thing that Primera was designed to solve. This is the enabler for things to come. Okay. I will show some of the things to come. Yeah. So right now, the performance insights will say, hey, you know what? That particular latency problem that you hit has a high score, which means this is actually saturation. This is a cause for, you have a problem, yes. Nobody is disputing that. But that problem is because as of now, your array is running out of its consumables to deliver your workload. We'll tell you what workload. But essentially what it means is you need more stuff. And in many cases, people will be happy to buy more stuff. They just need to be told that it's there. Tri diagnosing this particular problem today can take months. I can tell you this from experience. I've been called on many performance issues in the past. Trying to figure out what happened is very, very difficult, specifically because it happened in the past. So this is a performance heat map that's live? This is a performance heat map that is both live and it also has, a st we, we, we have a history. We can go and look back. Okay. Okay. So now there's an awesome question. Okay, this is not hardware. This is not saturation. I have latency spike, but it is not hardware. So first of all, 
This is very important. I want to know that I have an anomaly here, which is not related to hardware. And that sounds simple, but this is an astonishingly difficult thing to do because, uh, well, yeah, if you, hindsight is always 2020. Once you spend months troubleshooting a system, you can say, oh yeah, that is an anomaly, now I know. But you don't want to spend months troubleshooting the system. So we actually have a predictive analytics here that can look and say, okay, this is not saturation, what is it? We can look at our entire install base and correlate other arrays that are running workloads similar to yours. And we can say, okay, these people are running workloads similar to yours, and yet they do not have an anomaly, and you do. So there is something different. Then we can find what's different. So right now, we can detect anomalies, we can identify an anomaly not being related to a specific hardware. We can tell that the anomaly is related to workload change. For example, suddenly you started hammering the array with large block, right, large block writes, but you didn't do it before. So this is cross-correlation with sampling, but what's your chi-squared? What's your deviance that you know that it's significant? Is there, is there a standard or does that move? So, well, it will move, right? Because again, the model here is trying to figure out what's your difference. It's actually adaptive. Okay. It, it, it does learn. It, this is not a simple statistical correlation because you, you can't really because you need to look at the other guys. Right. Yeah, so we'll, we'll actually look at the other guys. So the, the model here and on the other one is uh, actually very interesting. This is uh, uh, something, it, it's a variation of RNN, of like a recurring neural network, uh, which is LSTM. Okay, so I'll, we'll, we'll talk about the next one. Yeah, it depends on the duration and frequency. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Pattern. So the next step would be to, yes, identify a more specific things about the cause of that jump. So if you suddenly know that someone is bombarding your array with IO that the other guys don't see, well, maybe it's a malware. Classifying it as a malware actually exists outside the array. You don't really know what it is. But we can highlight it for the security expert, expert to analyze in, in almost real time. Right, so the next one, this is something that we're currently working on. And this is what Primera enables. This is really an awesome thing for us is like uh, we have a, we want to get to a point where the entire storage system is run by AI and not by deterministic algorithms. So uh, in real life, so one of the reasons we don't publish hero numbers is because in real life arrays run many, many things inside that have nothing to do with host IO. Everybody knows that, right? We do housekeeping tasks. You do certain movements around. You do replication. You take snapshots sometimes. You move things around. How do you do that? How do you schedule that? Well, how do you schedule that? Actually, that's easy. That's when the customer wants you to most likely, or when you run out of stuff internally. Today, you start moving things around either when you're running into trouble with lacking some resource, or when the customer activates some operation. And those internal tasks, they just run, and they have significant latency impact. They just do. And most cases, people complain, well, you know, suddenly I have my perform I have performance problem, but I didn't really do anything. Yeah, you didn't, but they already did. And most of the times, the throttling of those things is really drastic. One of the ways to deal with this is to say, okay, you know what? I'll just throw hardware at it. I'll just reserve hardware for that stuff. <coughs> that comes into active, active. Yeah, you can throw hardware at it, then your system will have 40% of the hardware doing nothing, just being there in case. That will make it more expensive. Or you can say, you know what? I will just make sure that the host is not impacted. So I will just throttle my internals to a point where they practically never happen. And some people do that, some people do this, some people do a combination of both. What we do is we actually developed an adaptive model trying to figure out what customer workload patterns look like. So I hope you're going to tell us why this is AI and not just uh, yes. passive adaptation. Yes, because what it does actually, it actually learns, the, tries to identify the non-trivial patterns in the customer workload on the array. Because looking at the field 
means really nothing in this particular case because every every array circumstance is different. Yeah, this, let's, let, yeah let, let's hear too uh, what, what's happening on the array versus in the cloud. Yeah, what's so pre-trained versus so post-trained. Yeah. Nothing happens in the cloud. This happens on the array. So there is an, there's an LSTM based model running on this array which basically looks at what customer workloads look like and it trains itself on the array. So it's once, on your array, yeah, not yes, on Yes, this is your global. array, because otherwise it really does nothing. Yeah. Once it trains itself on your array, it predicts what your patterns will look like in the future. So that is, it's surprisingly difficult to see here, but there's an orange line and there's a blue line here. So the orange line is our prediction, and the blue line is what actually happened. And again, this is not a Photoshop. You can just take my word for it. This is real life measured system when we are able to identify customer workload patterns. Now, this is a huge thing because everybody knows customer has daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly workloads, but those are very, very broad categories. What you really want to understand is what happens at hourly or even minute intervals. That model is what it is. And because it runs on your array, it's periodically retrainable because you have this the moment you identify that there's a delta between what you predict and what actually happens, you know that model needs to be retrained. It gets retrained on the array. So yes. You're, so you're saying that with an AI response, you could be uh, sorting data to avoid cache miss. You could be making warming the cache up ahead of time. For example. So for example. Yes. So caching. Ca caching is an awesome example. It would be really nice to be able to prefetch the data into cache when you need it. And that's one of the things we're going to do. Evicting from cache is slightly different because evicting from cache is a much more overblown problem nowadays. Caches are really big now. Used to be a big issue, but right now, no. Prefetching, yes. Getting, again, remember, it's all about latency. Making sure the data is serviced out of as quickly as possible, that's a good thing. Currently, the primary, the, well, the first task target for this is to mitigate the effect of the system tasks, so specifically, Inside three party used to have things called region moves. Uh, if any of you know about Tune VV, when you need to change the VV from one type to another, that thing usually caused, well, it may cause disruptions depending on what your array is doing right now. So this is a real life uh, measurement what the latency spike used to be without running this AI. And this is what happens when we apply the model. So the spike is still there, okay? Anybody who says that they can eliminate the spike, well, they're probably lying. You can't eliminate, you can't get something for nothing. But what you can do is you can get to a point where your latency is actually back to like a sub millisecond range as opposed to two milliseconds when it was with those spikes. And this is a real, truly awesome thing. Yeah, this is, uh, this is actually really, really cool. And I'm yeah. glad that you're spending some time on it because as a long time storage administrator, what you said happened is really what would happen. I mean, the array would basically just sort of uh, drive using only the rear view mirror. And when things got loaded, it would say, uh oh, panic, shut stuff down, stop yeah. doing stuff. And then stuff would stop happening and it'd be like, oh no, what happened to the road? Now I'm gonna you know, start doing stuff. And it's just totally uh, reactive. Yeah, and, and, just like, yeah. and just imagine what you can do with this so cloud, so cloud is my second favorite topic after NVMe because everybody is so excited about cloud. Customers are really excited about cloud. They don't really know what they want to do with it, but they're really excited because it sounds cool. And I, I know I'm being a bit sarcastic here, but the, from the storage perspective, you know, compute wise and network wise, clouds are awesome. From the storage perspective, unless you run everything in the cloud, there are some paradigm issues. So everybody knows about archi archiving to the cloud. Everybody archives to the cloud. Archiving to the cloud makes sense if you never want to read your data again. Well, especially if it's a public cloud. If you never want to read your data again, if you just need to stick it in there for compliance reasons, you put it in the cloud because it makes sense money-wise. If you need to read it back, well, so some vendors make sure that you pay. So it is very important to put stuff in the cloud that you're not going to read on a regular basis. So tiering into the cloud is a very, very difficult proposition unless you have something like this. You can figure out, yeah, you can figure out what's going on. You can figure out what needs to go where. You can figure out what your access patterns are. You can stick things in the cloud that you're not going to need to read anytime soon. There is a lot of potential with those guys, types of models, and this is, this is just the first one. 
And, and I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, it's a caveat emptor situation. Um, your customer who doesn't analyze where that data should reside, that application should reside, is, is not really doing their due diligence. By the yeah. same token, if, even if you know that that data isn't going to require access immediately, it doesn't mean you can't ever get it back. It's just about egress charges, correct? Yes, it is. But the idea is, again, with the idea is that will allow you to figure out better what belongs where. It's just, they, this is just trying to, and the idea here is that those kinds of tools <coughs> identify deep, non-trivial patterns in the customer workload. Identifying deep, non-trivial patterns is a long thought goal because you can tear inside the array as well because you, you, new technologies are coming, new different type of drives are coming. You want to tear even within the array. Trying to figure out what to put where is a non-trivial proposition. Anybody here is familiar with the Monday morning syndrome or the weekend syndrome with the tearing? Because usually if you run a workload, then Friday afternoon your workload cools off because everybody goes home. The stuff gets tiered to your slowest storage during the weekend. Then on the Monday, everybody shows up and then your array crashes. It happens. So the problem is that the way people avoid the weekend syndrome is by saying, okay, don't tear on weekends. <laughs> sure. It's not a good answer. Bingo. It's not a good answer. This is much better. Well, and that's the, the perennial problem with all kinds of storage, uh, storage management and storage stuff is that basically you're always trying to substitute your own intelligence or whatever you may have of that for uh, whatever the system wants to do. And that's why for so long, you know, we did, you know, you mentioned like whiteboards full of, you know, information. It was all spreadsheets, you know, Excel spreadsheets about where every little bit of data is placed. And it took a long time to convince storage admins to allow the system to tune itself. You know, and yet we're still having that problem. Yeah. So, yeah. So, simple problem. The old trespassing of LUNs, is that resolved automatically? You never deal with it in the situation? Trespassing with LUNs, just like make sure that I get the terminology right. It doesn't mean like ownership of LUN primary path, secondary path, who has optimal path. You know, is that an issue in, in, in a So, again, that array? So from, yeah, so for that model, so you're asking whether we support a Lua and with preferred path? So the answer is yes, so we do. The more interesting question, can those models help you determine the optimal path automatically? Yeah. Eventually, yes. Because of failover situation of subsystems so, and, you know. So we can, we, we use a Lua for failover with peer persistence today. And over there, you kind of have no choice when you need to fail over. But can you use like an optimal path strategy and select, select optimal path? Uh, because that goes into uh, you know, administrative fine-tuning yeah. things. And so those, those kinds of models can help you do that. There are some technology challenges, for example, like setting an optimal path and switching optimal path with a Lua. It doesn't always work to your advantage. For example, today, a Lua has a significant disadvantage because you can't really pick a, optimal, a preferred path per command. This is a huge hole in a Lua standard. Today, if you pick a path, it's for reads and writes. But that's not what I want. I actually want reads to go here and writes to go here. Alua cannot do that. So well, well, they may change it. Maybe they will not. But what I'm saying is you don't want to also flip path back and forth all the time. So you can optimize for performance. You can change it. Those kinds of models can help identify that. Yes. As well, we're not, as, well as VASA? Yes. That will quite, so we're not, currently, we're not looking at interaction outside the array. Okay. The main reason we're not looking at this now is because it's uh, traditionally very difficult to influence the upper layers from what's going on inside the array. But that's a great point. You can inter you can interact all the way up to the up to the top of the stack. For the you benefit of viewers, can you define Alua? <laughs> Me? Anyone? <laughs> the acronym? The acronym? Yeah. <clears throat> Asymmetrical logical uh, unit yes. access. So essentially, yes. Yeah. Asymmetrical logical unit access. Essentially, you can have if you have a multipathing, if you have multipathing software, you can designate 
to multipathing software, not to do multipathing, for example. Because in an active active, that's not a real issue, yeah. but when it comes active passive, it's more of an issue. Yeah. And then the type of controllers you have, and then the failure situations where some controllers become unavailable, having some architecture for the pathing. Yeah. This is what today's management looks like. This hasn't changed for a while now. I mean, it, it, it's still difficult. I mean, people are making changes, but the management tools improve, but the complexity of the systems outgrows the improvement of management uh, tools. So we're making it an effort to avoid that. So not only are we using that, so the previous slides about intelligence, I hope they gave you some food for thought about what we're doing inside the array to actually reduce the load on that guy. Uh, but there are also additional things that were done about Primera in general to just make it a breeze. So it, it, it's, it's radically different in terms of management. You don't use uh, 50 zillion CLI commands anymore and go through, jump through hoops in order to provision this. Everything on this slide is accurate. And we have a very simple uh, self-service dashboard right here. Basically, you just connect to the, uh, to the array and the array tells you everything about itself. What, remember the monolithic to services oriented? So the first thing that Primera actually hosts on board is a new version of service processor. So there is no more the need for a physical service processor associated with Primera. It is hosted on the array and it provides a single web-based interface. So basically today you can connect to Primera and you get this. With Primera, you no longer need to reboot the nodes when the upgrade happens. I mean, it has been an issue for a while. The main reason that happened was that primar prior to Primera, 3 part had a significant uh, IO component in the kernel uh, for reasons that were perfectly valid. The, if you have a significant IO component in the kernel, you have to reboot when you replace that IO component. It just cannot be done in any other meaningful way. I mean, yeah, sort of Linux people will say, yeah, you can uh, do RM mode, then you can ins mode, which is fine, you can do that, but not really because you need to suspend all current activities going on, and sometimes it goes deep down to the bowels of the kernel. Uh, so we redesigned it right now, there is no need to uh, reboot the nodes. Things can be deployed on Primera in a much more simple fashion. Remember, when you replace a boot software on a storage array, it carries implications because when you update software on your phone, anybody here ever wonders what happens if that thing now dies? Well, it happens all the time. What happens if it dies? Well, you know, there's always an alternate boot partition. That thing actually goes back to your previous version. So playing with those is quite complicated. So it made upgrades rather orchestrated. If you don't need to reboot, you don't need to deploy, that offers a world of possibilities. So right now, we just we can deploy new Primeras, we can deploy multiple Primera code uh, software. Eventually, we will be able to deploy multiple different versions, which between them much faster than we've been able to do before. So, so this is a slide that it, it actually went through multiple, in, multiple iterations. So what does this have to do with management? It has everything to do with management because that is uh, something to do with scale. Essentially with Primera, you can start with the simplest, uh, smallest possible array and you can grow up. So this is a two node 630. This is, you can get to a two node 650. You can get to two nodes 670. Remember, it's just a matter of enclosure. Those are more and more powerful CPUs, more and more memory, but you can do this non-disruptively by changing one node at a time. And if you happen to buy a 630 in a four node enclosure, and you can buy a 630 in a four node enclosure, we'll just have two empty nodes. You can actually get all the way to here. Okay, and that's currently supported. So what are the differences between these two, the different models then? So number of nodes, the amount of memory, type of CPU. And again, if it's a two node, you can stick less drives to it. Is there a minimum node requirement for the 100% availability? Can I get that from two nodes or do I need oh, yeah. four? Okay. Yeah. We, in fact, 
if you buy 630, it only comes with two nodes, even if you buy four node enclosure. How do you guarantee 100% availability? That, that makes me a little nervous. To that makes those you a little nervous? Kinds of that should make <laughs> <laughs> Like how the engineering team okay. feels. Yeah. 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 Well, everything on this slide and everything on the previous slide, it's a combination of things, right? Well, engineer it properly, detect things before they happen, make sure that your management interface is simplified to take care of this without disruption. It's a combination of things. So, for example, the only only condition uh, to 100% availability guarantee is you need to hook your array up to it needs to report, it needs to call home. So we need the telemetry. Yeah, in fact, I remember somebody asked a question at the press conference that we did at Discover and asked, yeah. what, if, what if I can't, if, what if I'm in a dark site and I can't hook up to InfoSight? You can't have the guarantee. I mean, InfoSight's key to be for us to deliver yep. this. If you can't hook up to InfoSight, we can't give you the guarantee. That's fair, and that's, that's a fair requirement. Yeah, yeah. But some of the people didn't seem to quite right. understand that, but. So the timeless part, the timeless part was mentioned a couple of times, so remember, the investments are timeless. <laughs> the investments are timeless in hardware, the investments are timeless in software. The investments are timeless in media, so as I mentioned before, we will allow you to retain your SaaS media even when we go to different types of uh, controllers. At some point, that media will just go end of life. But until that media goes end of life, you will be able to retain it. Remember, SaaS media. You will still be able to retain it. So, resilient, again, it's all active-active. We don't have a single point of failure in the system. Services-centric OS, which we can replace parts non-disruptively. We'll talk about data protection in a second. So basically, we have uh, the same set, a suite of data protection that uh, Tripart had only. It's optimized for primary capabilities. And predictive analytics. So this is the answer to your question. How do we get 100% availability? The combination of those three. So this is something that we already know because most of the time, things happen outside the storage array, so we need to look everywhere, and we do. This is the InfoSight part, which I promised not to talk about because there is an InfoSight session, but I already mentioned the part where we look at the field, we collect and analyze the signatures, we store them, and we know to apply corrective measures before things happen. Oh, can you go back to the other slide? So right now, is InfoSight only dealing with the storage? No. Because when so you asked about Vasa, you... So you can see, yeah, there's, a, there's an InfoSight plugin. You can, look, you can look at various different things. You can look at VMware stuff. In fact, we have workload, we have topology insights that show you all the way from the virtual machine into a storage. Okay. So the replication... Is there any, sorry. any plans to make that container aware? <laughs> so uh, let me get back to you on with the specifics. So we have container plugins in our API. How much InfoSight is container aware, I don't know exactly. I know about VMware. They're working on it, but I don't know exactly what the current state is. That'll be a good question for the InfoSight session because okay. yeah. uh, we'll have people here that should be able to All right, great. give you more of that. I have some other questions. Um, you, you buy yourself a 650 four-node environment. How much storage is that? How much storage could it be? Yeah, so I'll, I'll look at, so we can, technically you can, you can get a 680, a 650, so it has all the internal drives and you can connect up to eight, uh, up to eight uh, enclosures. I'll look up the exact number after the session. I'll give it to you. I'm not sure I'm right, but four petabytes is in my brain. Is that about? I mean, it sounds about right, but depends on the drives you're going to put in it. Sure, of course. And, and, and other nuts and bolts issues, things like uh, dedupe and compression, and, and I imagine these are table stakes. So dedupe and compression are table stakes. We, we, are, we are doing dedupe, we are doing compression. So right now, again, the Primera, in terms of hardware, Primera hardware has support for dedupe and compression. Well, the dedupe engine, at least, the compute of the SHA is done in the ASIC. Okay, we don't compute the SHA in memory like 
some other people do. Mm -hmm. We actually compute in flight. We do other things in the ASIC, like the, the T10 diff validation. This is one of the reasons we can actually do 100% performance uh, availability guarantee, because we can catch problems before they are committed to drive. Uh, DDoP is stable stakes, yes, and compression is stable stakes. There is a plan eventually, like there's new hardware in, in upcoming primaries, not in the current one, but if we're talking about the futures, there are all sorts of interesting uh, Intel accelerators coming out that we may take advantage of. Absolutely. Yes. In addition to that, I, I don't believe I even heard, are we talking about block storage or file storage or object storage? What, what are we talking about here? So Primera is primarily block storage. Primera will have, uh, there is a plan to introduce file on Primera the same way there was a file person on, uh, in 3 part. Again, the dates, I was explicitly instructed not to talk about dates, but we there are other people who can dates, talk about dates, but, but yeah, but it, it will be file. Apps. Yes, so the block and file, primarily block, this is where Primera shines, where late, when you're latency sensitive. So in many ways it's quite similar to 3 part. Yes, in terms of what users should expect only 100% resilient. Fair enough. And expanding a little bit further there, jumping back to the other slide, all of that included in the all-inclusive licensing? Yes. Um, does that all-inclusive licensing also include support? And what tier of support, or what tier of support would be required to achieve this 100% uptime? So the tiers of support, again, I, I will have to de get the exact, I believe, I believe that's proactive care. Okay. But I will need to double check on that because I, I, I don't want to mislead you guys on this. Uh, whether how the support is priced will make sure to talk to people who actually talk about money. I'm an engineer. I only consume money. <laughs> I just spend them. I remember that one. <laughs> That's a great answer. I love that answer. <laughs> So replication, again, it, it's things that we know and love. One of the ways we achieve uh, uh, 100% availability is by <laughs> leveraging and enhancing our peer persistence. So we have a new type of offering in uh, our quorum witness. Uh, so quorum witness have been redesigned now. It no longer requires some third party databases that had security issues. We rebuilt it. Now the quorum witness is 100% secure and is connected by HTTPS. And the same way you can do Primera to Primera, you can also do Primera to 3 part. The, so it's 100% backward compatible. So you can actually build a peer persistence relationship between Primera and 3 part. And then there's a lot of flexibility in the quorum too. It can be cloud-based as well, correct? So we're planning on having a cloud base right now. There is assuming the good thing. There's actually very, uh, we can have a very interesting discussion offline if you like. Why would you want to have your quorum in the cloud? The non-federated for sure. Yeah, but cloud, so cloud, Remember, I don't need to tell you guys, you know this better than I, cloud, especially public cloud. It's not safe, safe. It, well, it's, it's, it's not always available because that's not their mission in life. I mean, it's available to deliver exactly what you're paying for. And if you want 100% availability, if you need a quorum witness who is the guy that's supposed to arbitrate whether your mission critical arrays are up or down, you may not want to have quorum in the cloud at the same time, you may want it in a public, in a private cloud. So, absolutely, that, that's non-disputable. So, do you expect your typical new customer to be new to HPE storage, or do you expect it to be people that are looking to upgrade their? That's a great question. I don't have an answer for that. I would rather have them both. So, in addition to Primera to Primera and Primera to Three Power, we also have heterogeneous replication using RMC. So again, RMC is the exactly, it's the same RMC, we just make sure the Primera works with it, and we can have an automated uh, policy-driven replication with RMC to other arrays, including Nimble. So the end-to-end -end data integrity, again, those are things that you all know and love from the previous uh, three-part architectures, but they are all included in Primera in terms of uh, technologies, and all, all being heavily used. And this is how you get that. And with this, I will thank you for your attention. I'm actually done, and I'm only 23 minutes over time. <laughs> uh, so any questions beyond what I've covered? 
and again, we can, we, you, you, I'm, I'll be here all day, so we can talk about it. So do you know what the genesis of this product was? Did they have customers come and say that they wanted 100% availability? Like, Well... So I, I think for this segment of the market, right, where that tier zero mission critical, you know, um, storage is required, then the answer is yes, right? You know, six nines is great, you know, but if we could take that extra step, that's one, um, one of the things that we found was a, a, a key requirement for this type of customer. I mean, if you could imagine a financial sector, for example, a minute could be very expensive. And so is this available for purchase today, or has it already started rolling out? It is available for purchase today. Yep. And we're starting to ship. Yep. Okay. So just kind of to sum up the whole Primera story, um, this sounds an awful lot like 3PAR. Um, you know, is, is this 3PAR? Is this a trick question? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's not, I mean, there certainly is a lot of new stuff in there. So you're asking whether this is a revolution or an evolution? Yeah. So it's an evolution, but it's a significant evolution. And it, there are some things that were changed or added. Because again, remember, there is nothing wrong with 3PAR. So there are things that were changed to accommodate forward-looking stuff. The AI stuff and 100% availability is forward-looking stuff. We want to build on that. Yes. Have, have we built on the basis of the initial three part? Yes. Have we changed the architecture to a point where this is no longer three part in terms of hardware or software? Yes. Is this a good thing? Yes. Definitely a good thing. I mean, uh, progress is always a good thing. But also building on the foundation is a good thing too. So I mean, as somebody who's been in storage a lot, I mean, I have a, a personal rule that I would never trust any storage system that doesn't have five years of, uh, of history behind it to for production data because y you just don't know what you don't know about the system until it's been proven out yeah. and until it's had some. So uh, frankly, my opinion is that um, I would be much more willing to use and enjoy and, and deploy a brand new Primera system knowing that it's built on the foundation of a you know, of, of decade or more of storage development than thinking that this is an all new system. Yeah, absolutely. And this is why, this is why I said it is. It is an evolution. Yeah. It's an extensive evolution, but it is. Yeah. And so the, the essential things, the things that re reflect, uh, you know, because I mean, what is a storage array? A storage array holds your data for you and gives it back to you when you ask for it. Those give, components. Give the back part is very important. Yeah, and well, that's the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter what else it can do. If it can't give you your data back, it's not storage. It might, it might as well be a network. But um, <laughs> it, it, it um, that hurts. <laughs> oh. But that's the, that's the important thing. And 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 so if the I'm going to hold your data and I'm going to give it back to you no matter what when you ask for it is built on three par. I feel better about this system. In fact, I feel a lot better about the system. I want systems to have history, and I want them to be proven, and I want them to show that they can actually give me my data back. And that's well, that's key. awesome. Make your data, it's not corrupted, and it's available. It has uh, consistent performance. Yeah. We, we've got, what, a decade plus of history behind this platform, and now we're just building newer, better stuff on mm -hmm. top of it. And awesome. newer, better stuff is great. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Oh, I yeah. love newer, better stuff. But I want it to be proven. I don't want it right. to be some some brand new thing that somebody at HP just thought of and started from a clean sheet of paper. Yeah, it's just really nice that we do have that history behind this, which is really cool. It's actually almost gone on two decades because I think they found it in 2001. And I don't know. I, I don't have any direct insight because I wasn't a part of what happened when we named it. But I'm guessing in that room, if I could have been a fly on the wall, there was probably a lot of debate of do we call it three bar or do we call it something else. Mm -hmm. And I think it was different enough that decided it needs to be something else because it's not three par. It's got the legacy of three par, but it's not three par anymore. Yeah, and it sounds like it's got a lot of significant improvements in this platform. I mean, don't, that's that's the thing too. I mean, I, I I think it would have been a fool a foolish thing to call it three par again because then people would have said, oh, it's just the same old thing. But there are a lot of differences here, and I think that 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 it was probably a question yep. of of you know of demonstrating that. You know, do you do you call your new Ford the Escort, or do you call it the Focus? You know, I mean, it's significantly different, so we're going to upgrade it. We're going to call it, give it a new name. You know, why just not give an example like a, like a Bugatti? 
something. Well, the first thing I thought of was. Yeah. <laughs> I like cars. I don't know. I had an Escort. It was a good car. It got me around. Uh, no argument there. <clears throat> okay. I'm sorry. I gotta go. I gotta go back to this 100% uptime thing that we talked about. <laughs> I, sticking in his craw. I mean, it, it, yeah, it is. It's, it's sticking in my brain. I mean, that's that's a great claim to be able to make when you're walking into a pre-sales meeting and you have a technical director and a CIO sitting there and they hear 100% availability. That's great. I assume that that comes with a, a shared responsibility model between HP Proactive Care, presumably, and the customer. Can you ex expand on some details of what that so shared responsibility is? It comes with a shared responsibility, and no, I can't, because again, I don't talk about money, okay. but it does come with shared... Well, not just money, but like... With, it comes with shared responsibility, and again, I can follow up with the people who can answer the question about that, okay. the exact specifics here. So I think that, the, and I don't know the details of whatever might be in the documents when somebody gets it, but I know I've had it made very clear to me that there's really only one thing that the customer has to do. It's registrable info. And it's connected to info. Yeah. Now I had somebody that just like, they were being really sarcastic. I, I did a chalk talk actually about this guarantee and somebody was being sarcastic on YouTube. It's like, well, what if I pull the power cord out? Well, duh. I mean, I think we're not going to well, like guarantee. It's clearly going to go it's, down. <laughs> and, and maybe that's actually in the details of the of the of the guarantee that I don't haven't seen. I, I would assume yeah, but, nobody but in the again, is going to think. I, th about I think that, that's, this kind of stuff is like the standard stuff, right? I mean, you have to provide like what happens if I don't have an un uninterruptible power supply, or my, my power supply is from a hand-driven generator. I mean, sure. I mean, you can, but bad things will happen. So that reminds me. When thin provisioning was introduced, I think it was 2006 or 2007, and it, there was a there was a live conference with the with the I think there was a CTO of Itachi, and he was asked point blank, so what happens when the array runs out of storage? Because that's like that's the, like the darkest nightmare of every storage admin with thinly provisioned arrays. What happens when I run out of storage? So he looked at the questioner very very seriously and said, bad things happen. So, <laughs> yes, there are only so much you can do, but yeah, but I thought the question about shared responsibility was do we share some of the responsibility, and the answer is yes. I think it was more pertaining to, to specifics, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, there are documents that exist that lay it all out, but, it, you know, it's important for a customer to understand how soon their critical patches need to be applied for, for that to fall under that shared responsibility model. And does that align with their, you know, their change review process? And can they get yes. those patches in place in time in a production system allotted? And it's all uh, true, but again, this is what the shared responsibility is. Mm -hmm. So the customer change control is absolutely paramount and it's outside our control. Right. However, making sure that the array has the right patches ready to go when the customer decides to deploy is on us. Okay. And this is what Primera does with the new management paradigm when patches are pushed and whitelisted. And you can literally go through the customer upgrade where it almost looks like upgrading, upgrading your phone without needing to do a complex orchestration with rebooting the nodes. This is what we're doing our part. But, yeah, they're enough. risking a lot of it. skepticism by telling people there's 100% availability guarantee. I'm aware. I mean, that's that's what you're going to be facing as well as long as, you know, this, you know, is, this requirement is met, this requirement is, so, um, I mean, that's, that's what you're facing, you know, Oracle Unbreakable, right? How long did that last? And, and so there's going to be sort of those thoughts about. Well, absolutely. But again, we just, we're willing to put our money where our product is. Yeah, it's funny because there's, you would think that there wouldn't be more than a 0.0001% difference between six nines and 100%, mm -hmm. but uh, surprisingly, there is a huge difference between yeah. six nines and 100%. That, that's right. a big, big right. difference between. Right. Well, that, so again, it, it should stay up and it ain't going down. We can, we, can, we can debate what six nines actually means because I think the whole six nines thing is like third most misunderstood term after NVMe and cloud, but <laughs> there, is a, there is a big difference between any number of nines and 100% up. Because any number of nines implies that depending how you calculate, there will be downtime that you are not accountable for. And there is a, everybody knows that to, it's a logarithmic scale. So everybody knows to get 90% of any project done, you need 90% of the time. To get the last 10%, you need another 90% of the time. Maybe twice that. 
So that's how it works. I, def I had somebody just actually the other day say something to me, and I, I can't remember exactly the context or even who it was, but they said, it's kind of almost unbelievable that you guys do this 100%. You should have done like seven nines or eight nines or something that is just not 100%. Who can guarantee 100%? To give yourself that out. To give, <laughs> but then it, the, the, to me, I mean, I started thinking about that. How, did, how would you measure that? I mean, when do you start a clock to say it was down? Is it when the application? And, and to me, it just becomes more complicated. And I think what HPE is saying is that we're guaranteeing 100%. And if we don't deliver, you're going to get that's something for it. And, and yep. most often when you hear vendors offer those nines numbers, they always count it as nines of unplanned downtime. Yeah. So they're still thinking, hey, you know, for upgrades and other things in there. Yeah, it's if you're actually talking 100% even through non-disruptive upgrades, that's, actually, that's a system I'd want. It's, it's a very interesting that you say that because sometimes it's nines out of unplanned and some people will actually say, well, that's six nines across all of my install base. And if my install base has 100,000 systems, that translates to a completely different downtime per single system. As I said, the nines calculation is difficult. But also... It's, it's for the... So one other thing to, to remember is when we unveiled this at Discover, right, um, it was very clear that during the presentation and the unveiling that this was 100% guarantee, uh, essentially without loopholes, assuming proper deployment. Uh, so kind of to your point, Wes, right? Let's take Primera out of it. Let's say you were deploying another storage system that had five nines availability. There's certain things that you're gonna do as a storage administrator or as an infrastructure admin in your environment to ensure the availability of that storage system. Things like making sure it's redundantly powered. Things like making sure it has the appropriate number of links. If you're interested in a Lua, you're gonna need quite a few network links. You're interested in fiber channel. How many switches are you porting it to? Same thing here. You can't take uh, a guarantee that we're putting forward in good effort and responsibility and then take it back to your office, put it in your data center, and then connect it to a one gig guy SCSI link. I don't know. Like, and what expect, are you doing there, well, right? <laughs> so there is a shared risk model, but it's not one, and this was very clear during the unveiling, that is a trick question, right? Straightforward. The answer's there. You have to deploy the system based on best practices. The cool thing is, is if you do that, we guarantee the uptime, right? So I think that that should answer the question a little better, right? We, we, it, it's very easy to sit back and poke holes and say, well, what if the power went out? Okay, good, good question. Take the storage system out of that. What if the power goes out in your environment? What are you doing to ensure the reliability of your infrastructure? Most enterprises, have floor PDUs that are redundantly powered. Most of them have an external power supply of some sort, a generator. Depending on the financial institution, many of them have multiple generators. Many of them have them the power an entire block. So there's certain things that you have to take into account about deploying this system that you would take account into deploying any hardware component in your infrastructure, right? The, the key is, and this was made clear during the unveiling, especially at Discover, it's not a trick thing, right? If you do this right, and we'll help you do it, by the way, it's not like we're gonna drop a box out there and be like, peace, right? We'll help you do it. You get the guarantee, right? Make sense? Yep. yep.